This is the current federal tax developments for the week of October the 23rd, 2017. I'm Ed Zollers, and I'm bringing you this week's developments that are brought to you by the Lascalzo Institute of Kaplan Company and your State Society of CPAs. This week, we have a lot of index numbers, so changes in numbers for 2018, all of which, of course, depend upon if Congress does something with comprehensive reform that could render some of them irrelevant, but we at least have what will be there to the extent things don't change. We'll talk about a memorandum issued by the Large Business International Division that gives us some information for units of property and major components for capitalization rules if you're in the mining industry. The IRS announced it will not follow a decision that involved an S corporation shareholder who had restricted stock and whether they, that shareholder could still count that toward the 5% ownership interest in determining if the person was a real estate professional. The IRS officially withdraws the anti cur regulations the IRS also gives us an announcement this week that 2017 returns that don't have healthcare information provided with them will no longer be accepted for electronic filing. And we'll, in the end, with talk about a court decision that arrives at approximately the right answer, but for all the wrong reasons. Well, it's that time of year. We're now done. You've done your filing. And so now what we're getting ready for is CPAs seem to love to do tax conferences in November and December and preferably the first week seems to be the big thing for us. So I wanted to point out that I'm going to be presenting at a number of tax conferences here at the beginning of November. We have a series of three tax conferences in November that I'll be presenting at. I'm going to start on Halloween, and I'm going to be presenting at the Pacific Tax Institute. That's put on by the Washington Society of CPAs. It'll be in Seattle, Washington. It will be held at the Bell Harbor Conference Center in Seattle. That's right on Puget Sound. I'll be lecturing on the 31st, have two sessions there. I'll give a session on passive activities, also a session on S corporations. As is always true with conferences, we will have tons of other speakers. We'll be talking to you on various other items. Now, Arizona holds their conference the same time as Washington, so I will have to fly out right after I finish up in at the conference there in Seattle. And I'll be heading out to Arizona where I'm on the committee for that conference. And I'll be presenting at the end of the day on the 1st of November, the federal tax update. That's going to be held in Tempe at the Tempe Center for the Arts. So if you're used to coming to the conference this year because of availability issues, it's not being held over at the Black Canyon Conference Center like it usually is. That facility was not available for the conference this year. There was somebody else got it booked first. But we will be down at the Tempe Center for the Arts. That is right on Tempe Town Lake. Uh, on the Rio Salado Parkway. And I said, I'll be talking about federal tax updates. We'll also have all of a lot of the regulars you're used to at the conference. Jim Hamill will be there, uh, Marianne Jennings, and we'll have all the others who have been around for that conference. So if you're here in Arizona, you can go ahead and pick that up again on the October 31st, November 1st, uh, be the Arizona Federal Tax Institute in Tempe. And then following up a little bit later, I'll go over to Portland, Oregon. I'll be at the Northwest Federal Tax Conference. They're handling, they're having that on November 6th and 7th. And that one, my topic is tax reform, tax cut or what, update on what's going on in Washington, D.C. This sounded like a lot easier topic before I before things started happening. When I accepted to do this early in the year, I thought we'd have things pretty much done by now. Well, it's certainly an interesting time, and I have no idea what it's going to be, what how things are going to be at the time that conference runs there on the 6th and 7th. I'll be speaking the day of the 6th. That time, though, I don't have to leave the conference right away to get somewhere else. So I'll actually be around for both the 6th and the 7th for that conference, but I'll be speaking on the 6th. One other now piece of news that is important. If you've not checked your email, you probably should. The IRS announced this week that the P-10 renewals for 2018 now are open for everybody. Uh, you can go renew your P-10. It's at www.irs.gov slash P-10. We'll get you there, the IRS P-10 page. You are going to need to have, of course, your password, uh, your username and password for the uh, system. So hopefully you've got that around somewhere. Okay, this year, very simple. They're being accepted now, so that's the good news. Uh, due to litigation we talked about earlier this year, there is no fee this year for renewing your P-10. You're simply going to go there, ask for it to be renewed, provide the information you've always provided, telling the IRS if you're behind in filing taxes and all that other information. But at the end of the day, you'll just have your P-10 issued with no fee this year. 
The deadline for doing this is December 31st because all current PTINs expire on December 31st. That's what happens to us every year. Now, I know this is one of those things that you'll do when you get around to it. Uh, remember, if you do that, you're going to be panicking here at the end of December trying to get through. I would suggest, so especially if you end up with problems getting your password to work, have other issues you need to do because those sorts of things happen to you in a case like this, uh, try it now and you know hopefully get yourself renewed. And when you do, then you're done. You're ready for the 2018 tax season, and we don't need to worry about anything else. You probably want to go check, get your P-10s up and running. Now let's get into the real developments for the week, the regular developments. And the first regular development I'm going to talk to you about is the, or is the big revenue procedure that comes out every year with the IRS's inflation-adjusted numbers for the following year. This is Revenue Procedure 2017-58, was issued on the 19th of October. Now, this particular revenue procedure, and we do have it in this week's materials, and it goes on for a number of pages because that's the nature of this thing. It covers lots of different issues. But it has all of those items that are subject to adjustment in 2018. That includes the issues for things like the tax tables are in there, the information for an income tax credit's in there, all of, all of those things have changed, all the things that are inflation adjusted, and there are a bunch. Uh, this year, we did add one brand new one. We have a new number this year. It is for the Qualified Small Employer Healthcare Reimbursement. That was added in last year's late last year. So we had a number for 17, it is inflation adjusted. So that will go up in 2018. Uh, it'll go up to the maximum reimbursement will be $5,050 for a single plan, $10,250 for family coverage. So, you know, we have that covered for now. That will be there. Another thing that changed this year, uh, if those of you who have to deal with estate taxes and those sorts of issues, we're going to have an increase in the big thing you're probably going to notice for your for your increase is going to be that the gift tax exclusion went back up for the first time in a number of years. It's now going to rise to 15,000. Now, please remember that's for 2018 gifts. 17, we're still at 14,000. But we're also going to have the estate, the basic exclusion amount for the estate tax, what we used to call the unified credit, is going to be there at $5,600,000. There are a whole bunch of other figures in here. There are penalties in here. There are all kinds of things. Everything Congress has, as inflation adjusted, except for retirement plans, basically, uh, will be in there. So you probably want to go take a look at this and update yourself so you're ready for planning for 2018. You'll have the numbers, knowing that, of course, everything could be changed by comprehensive tax reform. So some of these numbers may not be relevant after Congress is done. But for now, you'll work with what you got. Next up, we have a memo that came to us from the Large Business and International Division, and they issued a memorandum, an LBI, LBNI memorandum, LBNI-04-0917-004. This actually was issued on September 11th, but it finally got published for the guidance for everybody else these days. It's going to have a list of information for the mining industry, and actually it provides you with what is effectively a quasi safe harbor method of identifying both units of property and major components of those units of property if you're in the mining industry. Apparently there's been lots of confusion because of the nature of mining as to what would constitute a unit of property, what constitutes major units of those units of property. So they've come up with effectively a list. And for all practical purposes, if you want to use this list, likely the service won't challenge you. But it does make clear in the memorandum that there's a big caveat here. Uh, most likely, if you want to use this list now, it's not going to be identical to how you've been identifying units of property up to now. So now bad news, you're going to have to file a Form 3115 and request a change of accounting method. And apparently you're going to need to go back and restate your units of property for the for purposes of the mining industry to come into line with these with the items in here. So be aware of that. But if you are in the mining industry, you probably want to take a look at this memorandum. We have a link to it in our PDF for this week. You can download from our website. So you can take a look at this, see if you want to follow along with it, if it makes sense to you, or if you just want to kind of keep trying to defend your own list there. But obviously, you know, the IRS has 
got now what they believe to be the proper way of looking at units of property and major components in the mining industry. Well, we have the other inflation adjusted numbers that I mentioned that weren't in the first list came out in notice 201764 issued on October the 20th. And this is where the IRS gives us the list of retirement plan numbers, which are subject to inflation adjustment. Now, few of them did change this year. The one that probably most people will grab onto right away is the increase in elective deferrals. That's especially useful in 401k plans, but other types of deferral type plans make use of this number. That's going to rise by $500 next year to $18,500 as well. The amount of compensation you can consider in computing a contribution for the plan will rise to $275,000, with the maximum amount that can go into a defined contribution account will rise to $55,000. Now, if you're looking at the slides on screen, unfortunately, there is a mistake there. It says defined benefit account funding limit. That's defined contribution. The defined benefit, maximum annual benefit, is going to stay put at fifteen. dollars so that one didn't move around. The IRS, phase, the IRA phase outs, uh, you know, where you end up being, being unable to deduct an IRA if you're covered by a plan or your spouse is covered by a plan, those go up slightly. Similarly, the phase out for Roth IRA contributions also go up slightly. But otherwise, most other numbers simply remain unchanged. Again, if you work with qualified plans or retirement uh, planning, you probably want to go get notice 2017-64. That will have all of your 2018 numbers that you'll want, you know, and all those specialized numbers because we're not going to go through all of them. They're all sitting in that notice. So get it. It was 2017-64. You can get that again. The link to that is going to be found in our PDF. Well, the IRS ended up with deciding that they didn't like a court case. This one we've talked about before. They issued action on decision 2017-07. It came out basically on October the 16th. And this deals with a case we've talked about before. It was a case of Stanley versus United States. It came from the U.S. District Court of the Western District of Arkansas. Uh, for those of you who use the RA checkpoint, your citation there, 116 AFTR 2nd, uh, paragraph 2015, 5419. If you remember this case, what happened there was that we had a taxpayer who was a who had been issued restricted stock in an S corporation. Now restricted stock in an S corporation, if the person receiving it does not make an A3B election, that is ignored for purposes of both deciding if we have more than one class of stock for the S corporation and also ignored for allocating income to that person. And you really do need not to make the A3B election because if you make it, it's going to become, you're going to almost automatically have a second class of stock. So quite often not done. So this person had stock that had not vested, uh, but it was issued to him. So, you know, it's issued stock. It's just not vested. So he may have to give it back. The question became, he owned, the stock he held was more than 10% of the, it was more than 5% of the issued stock. <laughs> However, for S corporation reporting purposes, we were treating it as not yet issued. The IRS claimed that because of that, he wasn't a 5% shareholder. And because he wasn't a 5% shareholder, any real estate work he did as an employee of the S corporation could not be used as real estate work for determining if he was a real estate professional and for practical purposes. Remember, you have to both have at least 750 hours as a real estate pro and more than half of your material participation time has to be in real estate. So if this didn't count, he was going to lose on both counts. In this case, the district court in Arkansas decided in his favor and decided that it could count. The IRS, though, has told us uh, essentially that while the court may have decided that you could still count that term if he's a real estate professional, the IRS is not going to follow this decision. So if you cite this decision, don't be surprised if the agent and the appellate conferee both say, forget it, go to court, litigate it with us, because the service is not going to take this position. They're not going to justify it going forward. And because it is just a district court decision in Arkansas, you're going to be kind of having to hope that a court will find this persuasive, because you're not going to have a court where this is going to be binding precedent 
that you're going to enter into. So again, if you looked at that case, great case, looks good, but do understand the services announced that effectively on exam for all practical purposes, they're going to say, we're not do it, ignore that, that case doesn't count. And so you take your chances. Next up, we're going to do something we knew was coming, but the IRS this week in the Federal Register, in Federal Register document 2017-22776 that was published on October the 20th, officially withdrew the anti-cur regulations. We talked about those back a year ago, August, uh, when they were first issued. Those would have dramatically changed uh, planning for family limited partnerships. They would have imposed new rules, new basically test under section 2704 that would have served to effectively reverse the decision in the Kerr case. Now, as we discussed at that time, the tax court in the Kerr case based its decision on the current regulations and made very clear that you guys wrote them, you guys could change them. The IRS never changed them until somehow long after the Kerr case in 2016, they decided to, hey, why not pick this up now? Well, those regulations were sitting there on the books when, the, uh, you know, those regulations were still in proposed form. When the new administration came in in January, we had a review of issued regulations. And this obviously was part of those, we should say, of proposed regulations. This was part of that review. Uh, as part of the review, we had a couple of weeks ago announced that these regs were felt to be uh, counterproductive, shall we say, not something we wanted to go forward with. So not surprisingly, this week, we got the formal withdrawal of the regulation. So good news. So that, that much is done. It will not, if you're doing family and partnership planning, this definitely would have complicated that dramatically. Now you can pretty much go back to 2704. It's the same toothless beast it has been for a long time. And, you know, it takes work, you know, uh, unless you're really not paying attention, it's tough to make 2704 go against you. You know, if you have any experience, have any training in this area, you should be able to work around 2704. Next up, an announcement from the IRS. The IRS tells us this week that they are going to do something that they said they were going to do a year ago, but then decided they wouldn't. On their web page, and the page's title is the Affordable Care Act, What's Trending? Uh, they updated that article on October the 20th, and the IRS announced flat out that they're going to reject 2017 electronically filed returns that don't have the health care information. Let's talk about the history of this provision. Uh, the IRS decided to go ahead and process 2016 returns that did not have that information provided. Uh, assuming that repeal and replace was imminent. That's really kind of where they were. The IRS had not checked this on 15 returns because they couldn't get the computers working, apparently, quickly enough to have that happen. They did get it together for 16. So in 16, they had announced that when you file a 2016 return, the IRS was going to require you to either say, check the box, say, yes, I had medical coverage, or, you know, put forward your payment that you needed and give us the documentation about how you computed the payment that was due for your shared responsibility payment or tell us why you weren't liable for the shared responsibility payment and you know do one of those well as we said we entered this year and remember back remember back right after the november election when they were talking about having the repeal bill on the president's desk as soon as the inauguration was finished he could go down and sign repeal yeah, it didn't work out quite that way. And, you know, at the time the IRS said they, they were going to pull this back, we knew we weren't getting it on the day. We knew it hadn't happened on the day that he was inaugurated. But at that point, it still looked like the Congress was going to pass something to make this happen and to retroactively get rid of the penalty for 16. So obviously there was not going to be any big deal. So if these people didn't report, it wouldn't matter. So the IRS just announced they'd continue to process returns where that information was not provided. Now, there was a huge question of whether we could sign a return that didn't have that. And I hate to tell you this, but technically, I believe that answer was no, you couldn't uh, because, you know, it didn't change the underlying law. It just changed the fact that the service uh, wasn't going to, you know, wasn't going to bounce a return for not having it. 
but that that's not really our standard is not whether the service will bounce return or not our standard has to be effectively under penalty of perjury that we believe all the information that the return is complete in was complete and truthful and we knew it was incomplete but nevertheless not a huge issue apparently but for 2017 now they're going to announce for 2017 returns uh, IRS decided we're not about to bet on what Congress is going to do now. Uh, even though repeal and replace, I have a feeling, will come back up sometime during 2017. And I suspect we may see it very shortly after they get whatever tax bill they get done through. Uh, then, in essence, they can then move on to the next reconciliation. We can keep moving these budgets and get another reconciliation bill in place and try again. So that seems to be maybe the game plan. But even if that happens, I suspect the service is going to say, nope, you still got to have that. We'll process your return. And then if Congress retroactively changes the law and says, hey, you didn't know that penalty, well, you can file them into return and fix it. Or you can go on extension and hope they get everything straightened out by October 15th. Uh, but we're not going to take the gamble at this point that they're going to you know, do everything and get it fixed because obviously that didn't work out so well the prior year. So be aware, next year you've got to provide that information. Finally, we're going to look at a case that's kind of interesting. Uh, this is the case of Nez versus Commissioner. And the first thing I want to talk about in this case, that there is a fact pattern here. There's something happening. And it's a follow-up on another case that we've had, actually a pair of them, one of which we've discussed here before, one of which we didn't. Uh, we discussed going back last year the Ibrahim case which talked about whether a head of household return when filed by a taxpayer who essentially didn't have a right to file a head of household or single return. They filed a return that wasn't correct. You know, they, they couldn't file, they used a filing status they couldn't use. The IRS catches this, the taxpayer says, oh, I don't want to pay because they throw out their earned income credit because if you're married, the code tells us, a married couple has to file a joint return. If you're considered married under the tax law, you have to file a joint return. You can't qualify for the earned income credit. So they were taking away his earned income credit. Uh, and here's the other problem. You could still fix that by electing to file a joint return with your spouse, but you can't do that if a notice of deficiency has been issued and you filed a tax court petition, which you probably did because you panicked. You discovered, oh, I can't, you know. I can't afford to pay the tax and I don't want to pay the tax. I want to challenge this. What can I do? File a tax court petition. And then after you do that, somebody finally tells you, hey, guy, if you'd have just filed joint with your spouse, which you can still do, you'd get that earned income credit. So we had the case of, I of Ibrahim, as I mentioned. We also had a case just a couple of weeks ago, which we didn't talk about, but the tax court uh, basically going back now and following that earlier case. In the case of Camara versus Commissioner 149 TC number 13, also held that a head of household return does not count as a separate return that would bar you from um, from changing and making a joint return election after you filed a tax court petition. So in this case, what happened was now they had Ms. Nez. M you know, Ms. Nez had been married. She was married during the year in question, the entire year. But she and her husband had not lived together. She had the child. She had a child who lived with her. Their, their child lived with her. She maintained the cost of the household. For that year, she filed married filing separate, or not married filing separate. State, but she filed head of household. Her husband filed single. Now here's the catch. Her husband obviously can't file single because he's not. But the question became. Could Ms. Nez file head of household? Well, the court decided this was like the two earlier cases. She'd filed head of household. She wasn't allowed to do that. So the fact that she filed a tax court petition, uh, you know, when the IRS said, no, 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 they reset you unmarried separate. When they, she filed a tax court petition, well, the tax court said, well, she still could, if, if her husband agreed, they could still file a joint return and she'd get her an income credit. That's all great and wonderful, except there's one problem. She was allowed to file head of household. Because she did not live with her spouse for the entire year, she was, she was considered unmarried due to the provisions of Section 7703B of the Internal Revenue Code that says if you maintain a household for your child for the, for the year or more than half the cost of that, and during the last six months of the year, 
that spouse was not your spouse was not a member of your household then you're considered unmarried if you file you know we are allowed to therefore file a separate return and we're considered unmarried which means that our choice is single or head of household well hey with that requirement you're going to file head of household you're going to file that way so she was allowed to do that and because she was considered unmarried she would have been allowed to claim the earned income credit now the irs got all confused on exam and said no 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 no, no. you can't claim the earned income credit and said and you have to be married separate because you were married to this guy by the way they did move back together in 2015 which may also have confused matters because by the time the agent was there and going after stuff you know it appeared that they were living together and so you know we have all these problems that are in there well this illustrates a couple of issues that really is important uh first thing is obviously one real problem we have here is why wasn't this caught earlier well, she tried. She took this case dev on her own. It was a pro se case, and there's no mention anywhere that she had a tax professional involved. So I think the key problem we have for initially is that anybody who worked very much with this type of case, abandoned spouse case, would have immediately discovered that the IRS notice didn't make sense. Would have explained, no, she's allowed to file head of household. You can't deny her an income to credit. Now her husband's got a problem, and you know his part fine, you, you can deal with that separately and maybe want to follow a joint return with him in order to fix his problem. But I'm not advising him right now. I'm advising her and she's got her earned income credit. She has a right to get it. Uh, number two, IRS agents missing this. I hate to say it, but I've had that experience too, where I've had to multiple times explain to agents various things like what the rules are for divorced spouses, why it doesn't matter what the divorce decree says if there's no signed release form. You know, let's say divorce decree says that, and I've had this issue come up, divorce decree says that, you know, the non-custodial spouse can claim the child as long as that person is current on the child support. And so, you know, the person writes in now, of course, both parents claim the child, you get into that situation. Um, and you get into that case and, you know, if you're dealing with a custodial parent, they come back and say, well, no, you know, was what was Joe current? And, you know, I come back with a whole set of tax cases saying that's not really an, a relevant point at all. In essence, unless there's a signed release, it doesn't matter. And by the way, if the custodial parent signed the release, it doesn't matter if he's behind in the child support because the release was signed. That's the only issue. So unfortunately, a similar problem here. We probably had agents, individuals that weren't really up on the abandoned spouse rules. Uh, the attorneys in the case, often in these cases, the IRS attorneys, you know, the, 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 this is not a complex issue. It's not an issue that's on the higher end, so it seems simple at first, so people kind of skip. And it appears that, you know, we got really focused on this detailed question. Well, because it was unique and we just decided in the law and this case looked like those other cases. And so we got into a whole huge issue about analyzing those other cases and whether th this case, you know, in essence, that this person could make that late changeover when, in fact, it wasn't relevant. So it's always important. It's real easy to get distracted and start deciding the wrong issue in a case. And I think that seriously happened here. At the end of the day, she was entitled to the income tax credit. And by the way, we did find out from this case, if you do file head of household when you're not allowed to, instead of filing single, which is what's happened in other cases here, they filed single instead of head of household, well, then, yeah, you still can do this fix if they already filed a tax court petition. But otherwise, you know, take care, you know, watch this, because this is a perfect idea where everybody missed the obvious or what's obvious. I think it's probably as obvious to a lot of people listening to this that, yeah, abandoned spouse, you know, you're just screaming abandoned spouse. But, you know, you read the case, you'll keep yelling as abandoned spouse, and, and you'll realize that the case is often, you know, going off in a weird direction, a weird tangent. Well, hey, it's Halloween's coming. As I even speak on Halloween, as I said, in Washington, be sure to enjoy, you know, enjoy your fun. Get your candy, your trick or treat, candy corn, get your pumpkins all carved, get everything ready to go. And while you're there and while you're there handing out the candy, you know, may making may making some work for dentists down the line with more cavities for the kids. Uh, be sure to check out the CP or State Society is offering in their catalog here at the end of the year. 
We're coming up. This is key CP season. Lots of courses are being offered here in, in the late October and into November and early December. Make sure you take a look, grab, grab the courses that work for your, for your practice, and we certainly hope to see you in one of those courses as well. This has been the Current Federal Tax Developments for the week of October the 23rd, 2017. You can catch our updates during the week on our website, currentfelltaxdevelopments.com. Uh, you can also download a PDF that has the articles with this week's cases there at Current Federal Tax Developments. Just go to the weekly tax update tab, uh, and you'll find there at the bottom of the listing for this week's session, you'll, you'll find a listing there or items there for the PDF for this week's session. If you have any questions or comments, you can send them to me, Ed Zollers at CurrentFelltaxDevelopments.com. You can also follow me on Twitter. I'll be at Ed Zollers is where I'll be. Well, as we say, we're past October 15th, so I'm getting again to CPE season. So I'm going to be doing some in-firm work coming up here in the next couple of weeks, as well as those conferences, and then start doing some regular coursework too, just for fun. So hopefully I see some of you, some of you guys out there in the courses as they go around from place to place. If not, you know, well, we'll be back here next week talking to you about whatever goes on in the area of federal taxes here in the coming last week of October. We'll see you then.